today we're going to focus on these main topics. I'm going to orient you to the gravity of the situation as it is solely in the United States as well as in Illinois. I want to give you a huge number. It is estimated that there are about 20 million enslaved people worldwide today. 20 million. So let's put this in perspectives. Uh, New York's population is 10 million. That is twice that. This number is four times the number of what slavery was in the U.S. in 1860. This is huge. When we break down the numbers, 55% of victims are female, 26% of them are children that are recruited for uh, slavery as well as sex slaves. 22% really are in solely the sex trade market. When we look at how gravity, the gravity of the situation of it is, we see that it's actually the top grossing uh, industry right behind drug trafficking. Second to that is arms dealing. So we can see that this is a huge issue. We talk about drug trafficking, we talk about arms dealing, but we don't talk about human trafficking, and human trafficking is second on that list. We see that there are about 14,000 new victims that are brought into the U.S. each year. And that these human trafficking cases happen in every state. We don't think that it happens in the U.S., but we find that in many cases that since 2017, uh, we've been documenting all the reports given from the National Human Trafficking Hotline. And as of to date nationally, we see that there are 22,191 reports thus far since 2007. So in 10 years, we've seen that number jump. We've also seen that statistically in the last year, one in six child runaways may also have been sex trafficking victims as well. So if you think about the youth that you work with or that you interact with in your neighborhood or even just see in public arenas, one in six children are recruited into sex trafficking. In the state of Illinois alone, currently we've had 289 trafficking calls that are still being documented at this point and 100 cases that have been confirmed this year. And we have not filled out the year yet, so that number is going to continue to grow. We see that for many of those cases that they are kids who are running away either from abusive homes or dysfunctional homes. And these are prime targets that people will go after because they are vulnerable. Even though minors are engaged in the sex act of the prostitution end of it, they are still considered victims of it. They are very uh, vulnerable to not only having making decisions on their own, but then also trying to find a sense of belonging. And so it's very important to see that there are other complex factors that keep them into the sex trade in particular because they do not have all the social support systems or the guidance that they would need. And then developmentally, they do not have the capacity to really think out most decisions. Their brains will not fully develop until 25. So there's other things that we have to consider when making a judgment, I think, about what this looks like, especially when it comes with kids and not writing them off as being um, either rude or that they have no respect, but at the same point, what's behind all of the behavior that's driving that? We also see that there's many other vulnerable populations engaged in not only human trafficking, but in child trafficking. We see that with those who are immigrants, uh, those who are homeless, poverty is one of them, those who have been in a natural uh, crisis or if there's political instabilization at the government level. So it's not just kids and not just those who are in poverty. There are many other people we need to pay attention to as well. As we've already known at this point, it's a very hidden crime. Not many victims do come forward to talk about their stories or to seek help for many different barriers, whether that was in regards to maybe language, culture, Maybe there's a power differential. Most often there is power and control from the traffickers on to make sure that they do not escape. They will convince the victim that the law enforcement is not 
going to help them, that people will not never notice them, that they're going to live solely because, because of the fact that the trafficker is, is the good guy and is helping uh, him or her out. And we find that through that control and power piece, that's what keeps a lot of victims in the system. We also see that for many traffickers that they try to uh, identify with the victim as well, whether that is culturally, whether that is because they come from the same town or the same state, and they try to really bond with the victim so that they can have a sense of closeness. If you have a sense of closeness with somebody, you're more than likely going to trust them. You're going to tell them more personal information. You're going to take what they say into consideration. And over the long term, the bond builds, right? Uh, but we can use this bond in a very manipulative way, whereas we can strategically lead people to believe we have their best interest in hand, and then at the end of it, the manipulation comes out much more prominently because then we've gotten this person to a place where now they are isolated, uh, they don't believe that they have the capacity to make either voluntary or independent decisions, or their resources have been strategically taken away over the passage of time. Many victims don't seek help because they don't think that they either can be helped, they don't see themselves either as victims at certain stages, and they may actually believe, again, that nobody is interested in helping them, so why put myself out there for the wrath of my trafficker to then ensue upon me? We also see that with child trafficking that there are similar stages here as well. The difference really between child trafficking and human trafficking is age. Anybody under the age of 18 is considered to be a child trafficking case. All the symptoms and all the factors that lead up to that are similar with human trafficking. We see that with child trafficking, it involves the recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring, and the receipt of the child for the sole purpose of the exploitative factor of labor, sex, domestic servitude. We see that each year thousands of kids are forced into the sex, they are forced into the sex industry and are exploited daily. And again, this is not untouched in any part of the world. This happens every day, all day, in every piece of the continent. So not one continent is not touched by that in any way. We also see that with this industry alone, with uh, child sex trafficking, that it is a $32 billion industry. Who's getting upset? I, when I think about that number, I get upset and I start tearing up because then I really think about the gravity about not only how huge this is, but then how many victims are being subjugated each day, every year, year after year, and it is not stopping. So if you're not getting upset yet, we will get there. What this is also looks like with child trafficking, it's the exploitation of many different services. As we talked about hugely, it's sex trafficking. It's also about forced labor, doing the things in terms of labor that given the circumstances and where this child is, is either not age appropriate, it is not within the capacity of what a child can do, and it actually puts the child in harm. Uh, it threatens not only their morals, but then it also threatens their health and safety. We also see that with the forced labor, it's not just with working out in the fields, it is also children being recruited for armies. So this is our child armies. This is what it would cover under that umbrella as well. Children who risk their lives handling ammunition, using guns that they don't know how to use guns for and being told when to get up and to fight or to shoot. Children uh, are also involved in the drug trafficking as well. That's something that we also see as more of a prominent problem along with the sex trafficking, but again, right next door to that is arms dealing. We see that for most, uh, poverty plays a huge part in that. Children are either subjugated to being sold by families or being pimped out by a family member. 
We also see that the age and gender of the child is something that traffickers will take into consideration for obvious reasons. We also see if there's a history of abuse and violence in the family, our runaways in that sense, as we remembered from the past statistic, one in six children are estimated to be involved in the sex trafficking uh, industry because of the sense that they are running away from unstable homes and they want to find somebody who is going to either protect them or to take them away from this family environment that's toxic. There's a huge demand for child labor, uh, not only for, again, working in fields, but then recruiting for armies. We also see that there's natural disasters, political uh, instability in the government that's also part of this as well. I think what really brings out the light about human and child trafficking is that I can give you statistics, I can give you signs, I can give you uh, things that are also involved into this trade, but I think what becomes much more prominent about bringing this story out of the light is to have people really talk about their experiences and to really have them walk you through, in some ways, how easy it can happen. It's not something as opposed to there's this one massive international group that's solely looking for child labor and then they will strategically pick out people in the crowd. It can happen with somebody that you're just getting to know and you trust and then as the relationship develops they're in a point where they have difficulty escaping. We've talked a little bit about the profile of what a human uh, trafficker would look like, and I wanted to expand upon that a little bit further. We've already mentioned that can already be family members and friends. That can be individual pimps, uh, agricultural farms, industries, corporations, small mom and pop uh, shops, as well as the corporations. Uh, we also see that with the traffickers themselves, they often are similar to the victim in many ways. Most often it is based off our culture, nationality, maybe even language and shared experiences because this is their one way to get in. This is my way to relate to you. We both get each other. We know what this is like. You can trust me. We often see that with traffickers too, is, is that the myth is, is that it's it's the people in Russia, it's the people in China, it's the people in Africa that are the traffickers. It's not people in the U.S. that are traffickers. That is a huge myth. It happens on every continent. It happens with people who are U.S. citizens and people who are U.S. citizens are also uh, traffickers as well. So I wanted to dispel that. It is not an international thing coming into the U.S. It's happening on our own soil by our own people. We also see that there is no specific prototype. So. A lot of the examples I know I'm showing uh, have dealt with men. Women are part of this as well. Women do recruit children easier than men. We also see that intimate partners as well as acquaintances and strangers can be traffickers. And as we talked about some of the businesses that may be targets for that, we have seen that you know maybe those are like the fake massage parlors that are in our communities. These are the employers of domestic servants, whether that's individual or in terms of corporation. We also see that, again, agriculture is part of that as well. Uh, factories as well. So I wanted to just give you a glimpse that it, it's not one type of business. There are many types of businesses. And again, this is not an exhaustive list. One of the things that are one of the huge red flags I can give you are what's called brandings. They're tattoos. Uh, these women, children, men will get a tattoo under, um, most often being forced to get them. They're not doing this willingly. And they will have words such as property of, maybe on their neck or on some part of their body that they can hide. And usually it's like property of and then person's name. That's their pimp. Other words that you'll see are cash, cash only, sorry. Um, words such as daddy that are tattooed on there or any tattoos that when you look at somebody and say, uh, there was actually uh, one individual where we'll talk about later on uh, where she got all these good compliments about this rose she got on her arm. 
doesn't have words on it, it's just a rose. And she would always have like that skin crawling sensation because the rose meant something else. And so when people would ask her, well, what does it mean? Oh, well, uh, you know, I, I really just like roses. They're so pretty, that's why I got them. And internally she's like, well, that's because this is the gang that pimps me out and I don't want to explain this to you. So it, any tattoos that you notice that the uh, person has difficulty explaining why or how they got it, that may be a huge sign. Other things that we'll notice is that there are sudden changes in the way that this person dresses and behaves. Maybe you notice that they're working unusually long hours or really odd hour times that given where you know about this person, that's not typical for him or her. Uh, there's also difficulty making eye contact, especially with men. We'll also see a lot of untreated medical problems, cuts, bruises, broken bones, uh, chronic bronchitis, chronic flus, uh, things that you and I can probably take care of within a week or two with an antibiotic they are not getting treated for. And this also includes sexually transmitted illnesses as well that they're not being treated for. When you're involved in the system, you know where all the underbellies are. And the reason why they're so secretive is because they don't want you to find out as easily as you can. So if you have a group of people hanging out here acting suspiciously, that's going to be brought up pretty quickly, right? So you want to try to keep this as discreet as you can. And I think that that's where the, the frustration comes in is, is that because it feels so discreet and so secretive, how do you really know? Again, the only thing that you can do is say, you know what, I, I'm suspecting something's there. Can somebody investigate that and check it out? So how can we help? I, I know we've had strong reactions today. I know that I continue to have strong reactions as I talk about it and I review the content with you. Uh, if it is something of an emergency, somebody's being assaulted or hurt, call 911, don't get involved, right? So this is where we need to make sure that the safety of the victim is imperative as well as our safety. Us getting involved and getting hurt is not helping the situation. So again, immediate situations, call 911. There are other ways that we can get involved as well. Let's just say that you're, you notice or somebody that you've been acquainted with has started to change and you're starting to notice some of the signs that we're talking about today and you want to try to get this individual help or if you notice that this person's you know, on your work route each and every day and you start talking to them little by little and you get more information about what they do and how they uh, got to the place where they're at, here are some things to be mindful of. You can try to take the victim and put them in a more safe and confidential environment. It's going to be very hard because most often the trafficker or somebody associated with the trafficking uh, case is somewhere nearby just to make sure that this person doesn't run. And so it may be imperative to just try to like, just kind of discreetly say, you know what, we're going to have our own conversation over here and we're gonna talk a little bit more freely. Uh, I know that you're gonna be hanging out here, thanks, uh, but I just wanna uh, talk a little bit here without having the indication that you're going to try to pull this person out or that you're trying to save this person. The more discreetly you can, the less likely the trafficker is gonna to try to intervene. If you find that language is a barrier, most often it is, uh, try not to go to the trafficker and use this person as a translator for obvious reasons. And you know, conveniently, there's always somebody there in the lobby that uh, can also speak this person's uh, language as well. So how convenient that that is, what an opportunity. No, don't do that either. Another safety uh, that is in place so that this victim does not flee. What you can do is find a trusted translator, somebody that you know personally and can talk the native tongue in a discreet way where you can get a little bit more information or give this victim more information about the resources that are available to him or her. We don't want you to go in and try to be the investigator. This is what law enforcement's for. This is for what trained forensic mental health professionals are for only get the information that you think you would need to either make a report or to give the resources to the victim in a safe manner.
That's debatable because I also think that's human trafficking. Personally, I think it is. There's a shift now with that paradigm that it moving from prostitution being an illegal criminal activity to saying there are many cases, if not majority of cases, that are linked to human trafficking. We don't think so much about the brands that we buy and how the people who put them on the shelves or got them to there and grew the food or produced the clothing, how they managed to get that to that point and what under work conditions that they have. So I think that now that we are more of a research-based uh, nation now with Google and with the internet being so uh, prevalent and accessible to us, we can start researching on our own and become more informed consumers of what we do so that we're supporting causes that are consistent with our beliefs and we're battling this really huge problem that's happening worldwide. If you wanted to report a suspected human trafficking incident, this is where you would go to the Department of Homeland Security. I have the website up towards the end. And what they will say is that you can make the report either by phone or you can do this online. They actually have an online form you can submit. What they do recommend is that if you are going to make a report, do not try to contact the victim, nor do you try to confront the trafficker. Again, we want to try to make everybody safe and try to do this in a smooth manner. If you wanted to report a incident through ICE, that number is 1-866-347-2423 to support suspicious activity primarily around uh, U.S. immigration issues. That is accessible by 802-872-6199. This is a number that you can give to the victim and say, hey, if you ever needed resources at any time, call this number. You can also text this number as well. They'll give you services uh, that are provided in your area, not only for mental health, but for medical services. If you ever needed to you know, contact authorities, they will give you information about that as well. Uh, this is a federal uh, agency, but it is not a law enforcement agency. So I want to throw that out there that if you wanted to make a report, it is not through this agency. This is solely to give the victim resources and have him or her think about the options she or he has before they can start thinking about getting outside of the human trafficking system. This number is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, open up 365 days a year. So let's just say that we're moving the victim to survivor status, they are slowly getting out of the system, and they need to find some resources to help them become a little bit more stable because at this point, this is a sense of vulnerability because of the sense that they don't have money, they don't have family, they don't have shelter, they don't have ways or minds other than what they were used to doing to provide said services. And so there are many government programs that they can tap into as well. If somebody who is is an immigrant and is not a legal U.S. citizen yet, you can go to this website through the DHS and they will find immigration relief for this individual. They will help them uh, find out what their status is, what steps that they need to do to legalize it, and they offer them protection as they are going through uh, them becoming a natural citizen. There's also federal public assistance programs for those who need to get back on their feet that need financial assistance, that need medical assistance or mental health assistance. If anybody is under the age of 18 who's already been documented as being part of either child trafficking or child sex trafficking, they're automatically enrolled in this program and they start services right away. RAIN is also a uh, national agency that offers not only support but also therapy for people who have been traumatized sexually. This one I'm actually kind of surprised to see and I'm very happy to see and it's called the Chicago Alliance Against Sexual Exploitation. It's called CASE. They provide legal advice and consultation to those who have been sexually victimized and this one is Obviously in Illinois, uh, they do take on all of these cases. Most of them they will do either for sliding scale or pro bono. So if somebody does need legal services, that is a service that is available to them.